All right, well, you're not kidding. It is really freezing in here. Um, I'm not the one wearing a jacket typically, and I'm regretting it deeply right now. Um, so um, the events team pinged me last night and said, hey, there's a problem with your slides. And I said, no, no, there's nothing wrong with my slides. It's not a bug. Um, I am the most technical speaker today and probably in the rest of the conference, and I figured might as well open with a technical slide at the beginning. Let's test the part in the audience a bit. Does anyone know what kind of message this really is? Can I see a hand or something or shout it out if you know? JSON message, exactly. All right. This is what our computer systems are typically these days exchanging when they send information from one process to another. Now, I thought it'd be kind of cool to use that to introduce myself. Um, so I'm Frank Feldman. I run the Office of Technology in Asia Pacific, which means I have a group that cares about our product strategy, the long-term viability of it in the market. I also have the pre-sales team in my um, entire group. So anyone that does technology basically rolls up into me. And then we do enablement for the organization across Asia Pacific on um, sales, pre-sales, and consulting. Um, as a side job, I have a CTO-like role, uh, but it's not a normal CTO sort of role. You know, CTO typically means chief technology officer. That really sits in headquarters, although I, I tend to do some of that. But there's two other flavors of the T in, in this, and one is chief talking officer. I'll try to do some of that today. And sometimes in busy periods, you're a chief travel officer. You get that as well with it. Um, but today, it's chief talking officer predominantly. A little freezing, but that's it. All right, so welcome to Partner Conference. Um, it's awesome to see you guys all here because what it really says to me is that our business, and your business in particular, is doing really well. If you can afford to fly all the way from where you came to be here in this beautiful island and spend a couple of days with us, that means we're doing something right together. Right? And I'll talk more about that part throughout the, uh, the presentation. Um, I've spent 10 years in and out um, in Asia Pacific in, in, in Red Hat. I could really do a long history type talk with you today. Um, I've seen the history repeat itself. Here's how it's going to happen and all that. And I've decided to not do that today. Because I think you've seen many of those talks before on, oh, you know, I know the future because I've seen what happens. So we're not going to go through that at all. So I will not tell you today that Red Hat Enterprise Linux runs on x86 on any vendor you have there, IBM Z power or ARM. Did you know that? It runs on ARM too. I'm not going to tell you any of that. I'm also not going to tell you that we provide, across all of those platforms, a 10-year cycle. All right? We're not going to talk about that. Or that it's documented completely or certified. You can get training on it or anything like that. I'll skip that because you know all that, right? Yeah, you know all that. I'm also not going to tell you that that same platform by the same people with the same skills can be deployed on any of these cloud providers today. Wherever you are in the world, you can use Microsoft, you can use AWS, you can use Google, you can use NTT, you can use Ali, you can use Fujitsu. The list goes on and on. Pretty versatile thing, but we're not going to talk about that either, OK? What I'm also not going to tell you is that Red Hat OpenStack won the Cody Best Infrastructure Software Defined Infrastructure Award. Now, I don't know if you ever read the Cody Awards, but that's pretty hard to win. And we won it. Pretty damn good. Now, Fujitsu recognized that because they already bought into it a while ago. But this is pretty decent. I'm also not going to tell you that OpenStack is a VMware killer. <laughs> what? No, because it's not. Seriously, it's not. All right? We've talked about this stuff for years. You know, how do you take out infrastructure? How do we compete against VMware? Rev is not a VMware killer. I'll say it out loud. It's not a VMware killer. OpenStack is not a VMware killer. But there are some things that are, and we'll talk about those a bit more today. First of all, I'm also not going to tell you about our middleware portfolio, because you know all that. Our middleware does great in saving customers piles of money. And by the way, when they deploy it on OpenShift, they're accelerating the deployment of our middleware. You may want to think about that as a partner. It's extra money on the table right there. But we're not going to talk about that in detail either. What I will really talk about is some of these things, trends that are driving what customers are really, really doing, which is one of them, codifying their infrastructure, creating a natural abstraction, if you like, using things like Ansible to wrap 
all the things they care about in an easy to understand language that allows them to compose their infrastructure more easily into whatever you know, needs and cases that they have. We will talk a bit about how Kubernetes has become pretty much the new layer of some nerds call it the kernel, some call it the runtime, but it is the new layer that orchestrates applications or the services that make up applications on a very large scale or you know, if you want, even on a small scale. Right? Uh, we, we even ship products these days fully containerized, but you know, it is still a single product when you think about it. But Kubernetes is growing crazy. And then for the, the wilder thinkers out there, serverless. I'll tell you a secret, there is still a server somewhere. Right? These things run somewhere. But serverless really shifts the notion of having to understand any of the infrastructure pieces completely away. You concentrate on developing a function and it gets sprung to life when there's an event coming in that requires the function to do something and it disappears off your radar when you're done executing that particular function. Um, very fine-grained sort of development architecture that we have there. Now those things are going to be the VMware killers because this drives a very different way of how we look at infrastructure, how we look at building applications. And if you put these things together, the things that we see in a traditional environment, the control points that you have on infrastructure become very, very different. In fact, they become almost irrelevant. If infrastructure becomes that easy to use and gets you know, activated and deactivated as and when it needs to, then you do not put that much control point there anymore. It shifts up towards the application layer. And uh, well, I think we have a fantastic portfolio there. So why now? In Red Hat Summit, we demonstrated, and this is the first time we actually demonstrated it live on stage, a migration, a real migration of virtual machines on a VMware vSphere environment and move them onto a Red Hat virtualization environment. We could have demoed that last year, the year before, the year before that even, but we didn't. We chose to do it now because at this point in time, we see such a huge shift in the thinking of how customers want to consume technology that they need to think about migrating to something better. If you move from a VM to a VM, that is really boring. There is no real significant advantage in that from a customer point of view. Right? Unix to Linux was different because Unix had a high cost ratio to it, but x86 virtual machines to x86 virtual machines, seriously, is not that sexy. But going from virtual machine architecture to containerized microservices and serverless, that is a very interesting thing for a customer to do. So why are we then now interested in explaining to you a little bit that migrating virtual machines is important? For the very simple reason that there is still a lot of money sucked into that infrastructure management, which our customers definitely would like to shift into this new stuff. And this is why the timing of a virtual migration solution is very, very good. We actually have some real examples in Asia Pacific of this, where literally we had two or three meetings with the customer to illustrate how this works. And the cool, the cool thing really is, they now see Red Hat as an enabler for innovation. Now in the past, we did that too, because think about it, Unix to Linux, what did we do? We saved the customer a lot of money. Right? We did something that they understood very well in a simpler, more cost-effective way, and the savings they had, where did they go in Unix to Linux? Anyone remember? Oracle, for example, consumed a lot more money as a result. We helped Oracle, actually, in that sense. Not this time, because all these new technologies I just talked about, Kubernetes, you heard DP talk about OpenShift, OpenStack, that's what people want. So this time, as a partner, this is the best, best time ever to be in Red Hat. Not only can you migrate and be the good guy to release the funds, you can receive the funds and do this new stuff. It's a double whammy this time for us. It's a really, really good time. That's why this solution is getting a lot of attention inside Red Hat. You'll see more about it in terms of the tooling and also the training around it. Watch out for that space. So, but let's talk a bit about the, you know, how people are moving applications, um, because I think everyone would agree with me that we are probably a standard or default standard for infrastructure. But we're seeing a lot of us getting into the 
platform for applications, becoming a standard for the platform of applications. And that, I think, is something really critical because as we talked about infrastructure becoming less and less important and more normalized, for us, the relevance is moving into application layer. We need to get into that space. And that's where OpenShift investments have been really big. So we talked about Cathay a little bit, but there's a couple of key words in the reference that, uh, to me, stand really out. This is Carrie. She's the, the lady who runs the entire IT operation there, has been our sponsor, and over time, I think, has become really, really happy with us as a partner. Um, she uses those words when she speaks about the relationship with Red Hat as a partner. But here's one of the things that I like. If a CIO says in public, and by the way, she wanted to say this. It's not like we went on our knees and said, please come to my event and speak about this. No, she wanted to be in Red Hat Summit and say to everybody there, 4,000 strong or whatever the number was, we deliver value now to our customers much faster. How many CIOs do you know who would want to say that? A lot, all right? She realized it by working with our teams and our software to get it there. And then the other part, we now have more time to do what matters. How amazing is that? To enable a CIO to go on a public stage and say that to the world. I thought that was amazing. It tells a lot about how strategic we are becoming as a software vendor to our customers. All right. now, now that she has more time, guess what she did? She went back and she said, hey, Let's look at these virtual machines that we have there, because I need to fund some more innovation. Pretty cool. Um, another one in this space, um, I can't name them yet, but uh, you can kind of guess who this might be. A major telco in Australia has adopted Ansible in a very, very large way in their networking division. A couple of key points that they wanted to share with us. Um, number one, why Ansible? Because it gives them total control without compromising their security. Now, you've got to think about that a little bit if you're in the networking space. Um, security, especially as a telco, is kind of critical. Um, you have a lot of customer information flowing around these things. You do not want to get compromised in any form of way. One of the reasons Ansible was chosen by these guys is we do not deploy any additional software, no agents or anything like that, on their architecture. We leverage the existing control points and controllers that they have in their architecture, and hence we do not expand the potential threat attack plane when deploying this management software. That's a very big thing. You may want to think about that when you go back to your customers, because this applies to any business that has any form of regulatory compliance to it. It's a very, very interesting point to highlight, and all of our competitors do require additional software to be installed. The other thing that was really cool in this case, they have customer IP when they onboard a customer and specific you know, requirements in networking, and they have core IP that you know, helps them to be a better competitor for a networking business and so forth. And they needed to separate that very easily. And because of the way you develop Ansible integrations, it's a plain text file basically, very easy, modularized. They could separate the core IP of the company very effectively from the things they had to develop for each customer to do their onboarding. Helps them scale. And finally, and this is the part I like the most, they didn't require a nuclear scientist to make it all work. Well, that helps to scale your business too, right? And has a lot of confidence for the longevity of the technology that you choose. It is easy to use this stuff. Um, it is also a very fast growing product in our portfolio. So, you know, they now have the ability to create a more composable network infrastructure, which is a core differentiator for them, and they're standardizing on this across the company. Pretty impressive um, win from, from our side. Now, you heard DP talk a bit about uh, this new, new relationship of ours with Microsoft. Um, I do want to talk about that a little more because it has some significant implications uh, and, and illustrates to me how we are becoming the platform for, the, for tomorrow, in particular on applications, right? Uh, Azure, as you all know, probably is a very large public cloud offering and gaining a lot of ground, doing a lot of good work. And we've had you know, basic Red Hat Enterprise Linux available on that. This arrangement, this expansion of our partnership is very significant in that Microsoft has chosen, and I can guarantee you they evaluated a few technologies before they made that decision, 
has chosen to use OpenShift as the container platform on top of Azure and offer it to their customers. That's a very key word there. They will be selling this to their customers. There will be on the Microsoft websites pages promoting and positioning these offers to their customers. It's not just Red Hat saying to a customer, hey, you can run it on Microsoft. No, Microsoft is telling their customers this is gonna be something you have available. That's very significant. On the technology side, and DP couldn't talk to that because I think he wanted me to do it. <laughs> um, there's some really significant stuff there. OpenShift will be able to support and manage both Windows containers and Linux containers. We're the only vendor that has been able to figure that out, first of all, technically in a proper way, and then with a vendor like Microsoft come to an agreement to provide 24-7 global support coverage, training, and yada, 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 everything that you need as an enterprise to be able to have one application management platform that can power both Windows and Linux containers. What does that mean? We're giving the customer choice. And this is something you've seen recurring in Red Hat, I think, over the last 10 years. We like to provide customers choices. Sometimes makes it a little harder to sell because, you know, choice means you've got to figure out which one you want. But choice means an ecosystem with negotiation power for the customer, and that's a healthy thing. All right. um, we're also doing some additional things to reach Microsoft's developer ecosystem. For example, very soon when you get your copy of Visual Studio, which is the tool that many people use in Microsoft's ecosystem, you'll also get a subscription to Reddit Enterprise Linux included with that. So we're starting to seed this you know, multi-product, multi-platform concept um, for people. Now they introduced Microsoft Azure Stack, which is the on-premises version um, of the Azure portfolio. And we've made sure that it doesn't really matter whether you run OpenShift on Azure Online, whether you want to run it on-premises, we're okay with that. So the platform can run in, in both, both those cases. Again, coming back to the hybrid cloud message from Red Hat, we're trying to make sure that sticks. And trust me, that's not an easy thing because Microsoft is definitely a cloud-first company now. And Nadella has said that many times. We think my, Microsoft and us and Amazon and Google, hybrid is the way, and you know, this is the way we do that. Right. So very important thing. Um, and again, both Windows containers and Linux containers managed under one umbrella. This is very significant. Again, it pushes developers to not care on what is this thing running on. I just write my code and it needs to get published so that I can build my apps out. So, OpenShift is the new magical runtime or the kernel or you know, call it what you like. But for us, this is the new RHEL. This is the way we're gonna build our business. And it, again, tries to provide what RHEL did, freedom without compromise. So what does that mean if you wanna deploy this thing bare metal, and I highly encourage you to not forget that use case. Bare metal OpenShift rocks. It is super fast and efficient. You do not need any virtualization layers whatsoever to run a good OpenShift cluster. All right? That's totally supported. We do it on x86, we're doing it very soon on IBM P, and we're gonna do it on ARM. All right? So that's a pretty decent set of choices in terms of hardware. The second one, if you do want to go virtualized because you just happen to have a lot of that stuff or you're set up process-wise to do it, fine. You can do it on VMware, no problems there. You can do it on Hyper-V or you can do it on our own, on Rev. You might save some money by taking VMware out and move to Rev and buy more OpenShift, okay? Now, if you want to go private cloud, definitely possible. You can still do that. Azure Stack, we talked about that just now, and OpenStack. Right, Reddit OpenStack, like what you heard from some of the other speakers from NTT Data. Right, definitely a very viable use case. Public cloud, this is an amazing feat, to be very honest. You know, OpenShift is a pretty complex piece of technology. Already today, you can deploy that without any problems on Google, on AWS, <coughs> excuse me, um, on Azure. You can deploy it on um, other public clouds like Ali Cloud very soon, because we're working with those guys as well on this stuff. But if you don't care about any of this stuff, no bare metal, no vert, no private cloud, no public cloud, then we also have now the managed offerings. And I highly, highly recommend as a partner you think about this. 
Managed offerings means you have virtually no time between contract and getting into a project. You can literally start coding, building the application, solving customer problems. Like what Carrie was saying in, in her reference, I can get real things, value add, done quickly. Managed is the fastest path to getting an OpenShift environment up and running. This is what Microsoft will be providing to their customers too. Managed jointly by Red Hat and Microsoft. We provide it today ourselves on Google, on AWS, but these are very, very good products to sell if you want to shift with us to the application important aspects of a customer. All right. No other Kubernetes solution or open uh, container platform solution offers this type of versatility. It just doesn't exist. All right. Now, everybody is becoming a software company. We've all heard that. So I wanted to also spend some time on how we um, are you know, eating our own dog food in, in that sense. Um, we have shifted a fair amount of our thinking and engineering to be cloud native first. For example, some of our products like Fuse that are listed here, the directive inside of our engineering team is you cannot release the product or the versions or flavors that you have unless you release for cloud first which drives a significant mindset change in the company on you know, the velocity and the types of you know, user uh, acceptance testing and those sorts of things we have to apply to those products, right? Um, DP mentioned CoreOS a little bit. I do want to spend a little bit of time on that. We did a couple of things with that acquisition. Number one, CoreOS had a very fascinating host operating system, the way they designed that for running containers. Obviously, we had our own in Red Hat, but they had some really unique features, one of them being the way they updated the host systems was very, very nice. It's almost like the way your cell phone gets an update from time to time. Um, we wanted that capability, actually. And uh, well, you know, since we have a good war chest, we decided to acquire that capability instead of spending time building something similar. Um, the other thing that was very much important to us, sorry, um, OpenShift, some of the feedback from our customer was the time it takes to get operational, the day two operations parts of the product were lacking. Needed better capabilities. I see some of our country managers nodding heads. They felt the first wave of pain. That's normal when you have a new product. You'll miss certain features. You'll miss certain capabilities. But this was an area that CoreOS had invested in significantly and a really, really nice setup for. So that was the second benefit for us. When we acquired that company, we gained a big step forward in day two operations. Um, and you'll see that coming probably in two months or so more in the next big release on, on OpenShift. Um, they also provided a enterprise container registry called Quay, um, which we will continue to take to market as part of the acquisition. We announced at Summit um, the availability of something called Istio, which is a framework, I guess is the way I, I would put it, but it allows microservices to be glued together much more easily uh, whilst gaining better insights and control over you know, what happens in your microservices architecture. It's a very important, very early rising um, framework and we're gonna make that available. And then we tipped our hand a little bit in Red Hat Summit. Um, we did a demo there, very short, but for those that paid attention, I thought it was interesting. We illustrated how to treat a virtual machine as if it is nothing more than a container. So instead of using tools to manage virtual machines and virtual infrastructure, we envision a future where the VM, whether you still want it or not, is a pointless discussion. No one should care. If you have stuff that still runs in the VM, fine. But if Kubernetes is becoming the new control plane for pretty much all of your architecture, we think we need to provide our customers with a path to treat VMs as if they are part of the Kubernetes architecture. So we started an open source project called KubeVert. You can forget that name if you want, but it is a place where we're innovating on how do we basically apply the concepts of Kubernetes and containers onto a virtual machine infrastructure. Which means for us, if we you know, extrapolate this future a little further, two years from now, OpenShift will control bare metal, it will control virtual machines, it will control a public cloud environment. It don't care anymore. It's about the applications you're trying to run and how fast you need those to be available and scale up and down. So a pretty big, big move there. Um, and you'll see us investing quite a bit of time and, and money in, in that space. 
So what should you do differently as a partner um, based on all this uh, technical information? <laughs> If I was in your shoes, um, I would be extremely excited to have, first of all, a company like Red Hat to partner with, because we have stuck to our guns about being open and giving customer choice. We haven't you know, surprised, I think, any of our partners by changing our strategy rapidly, but we have the right infrastructure, as you heard from some of the previous partners speaking here, to power very significant infrastructures, whether it's on-premises or off-premises which is a great play for a partner business. We are rapidly becoming the number one when it comes to enterprise Kubernetes, which is a booming business. And I highly recommend you to go out in the breakouts and, and invest time to absorb and learn about those technologies. And then the management part, right? the Australian telco reference I talked about. The ability to use basic structures to start to make composable infrastructure is a very, very powerful foundation that your customers will need when they want to move further away from managing infrastructure to building apps faster. All right. Those three things, why now? I would definitely do them there. Now, here's the other reason why now, and I firmly believe this, and I have real examples from country managers on this. We cannot pick up all the business that is starting to emerge around us. The market is moving faster than all of us. It really, really is. The number of things that are popping up everywhere that I would want to be involved in is ridiculous. Right? And my wife is telling me every day, stop reading the news, stop responding to emails, because you can't do it all. I'm not alone in that. Everyone in Reddit has that, which means there is a huge opportunity for us to work together. More than ever, I see that. And I do believe together we can beat that market. Right? Now, if you agree with me, then I invite you to get ready and get enabled. Um, in the uh, second week of September, we will have the Red Hat Tech Exchange, which is the event where we train our own guys, our SAs, our consultants, project managers, and so forth, on the latest and greatest. We fly in the best engineers, the best product managers from all over the world to go and do this. And we invite you as a partner to bring your best guys into this as well. Um, it will be in Taiwan. Um, and we have an early bird registration still open for, I think, another two weeks. Uh, we're already at 500 plus registrations for that event. So twice the size of what's in this room is coming to this thing. You want to get ready? This is the place to go. Thank you. <laughs>